Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. First and foremost, before we get this epistle started, I'd like to give all praises, honor, and glory to our beloved Heavenly Father and His only begotten Son, our beloved Lord and Savior, Yahweh, Bahasham, Yahweh Shai, Bahasham, Harachak Wadash. Double honors as always to our apostles and our elders of Great Millstone who rule well, who teach well, who we learn the truth from daily, whether you hear or forbear, and our sincere salutations as always to the rest of the hopeful elected the nation of Israel which consists of our sincere elders in Akim of Great Millstone and the Akim on down that teach the likewise doctrine and truth and sincerity. The Akim of the nation of Israel that are believers of the word and rehearse the righteous acts of Yahweh Bashmi al -Shai. the speckled bird Hebrews are like foreigners scattered among the heathen that look like the heathen and the sincere Akwathim of the nation of Israel, which is to say the sincere sisters of the nation of Israel, listening to silence and meekness as the scriptures command to do so. And this is going to be another Shabbat day reading. Okay, the Shabbat came in last night, all right, at evening. And this Shabbat day reading is going to be on the topic of the order of Melchizedek. And this is one of the topics that was a, um, <clears throat> this is one of the more um, meat scriptures, one of the more meat precepts to get into. All right, especially once if you grew up in the Christian church. And, you know, with the limited understanding that they give their followers. But right here, as I do with the other Shabbat day readings, these are the true, holy and powerful and mighty names of the Heavenly Father and His only begotten Son. OK, each of them has one holy, powerful and mighty name each. OK, so the first is the Heavenly Father's name, first and foremost. And this is in the Hebrew, the original Hebrew, the Lashwan Kodash, which the world calls Paleo Hebrew or the Phoenician Hebrew. OK, so we have the Ya, the Ha, the Wa and the Ha at the end. The Wa and the Ha connect. So the name is pronounced Yahawa, which means he is. OK, he's the Ancient of Days. He has no beginning. He has no end. And one of his titles was Alashadia, which is where you get the English term God Almighty from. And Alashadia means terrible demon-like power because he was the power that once flooded the earth. Okay. And this right here is his only begotten son's name who sits at his right hand. Okay. Once again, Hebrews read from right to left. So we have the Yah, the Ha, the Wa, the Sha, and the I. The Sha and the I connect. So it's Yahweh Shai, which means he saves, he delivers. This is the only begotten son of the heavenly father our king of kings lord of lords mediator high priest and way back to the heavenly father okay so through these holy and powerful mighty names will the chosen people of the heavenly father be saved okay and the chosen people are the true biblical hebrew israelites always has been always will be and those people today go by the bywords of being the so-called negroes latinos and native americans and we have our speckled bird brothers and sisters, as I've stated earlier, that are also Israelites like us, but look like the heathen nations they've been scattered amongst. So they will not have the typical so-called Negro, Latino, Native American appearance, but they also go back to the 12 tribes as we do. OK. Now, getting back into the topic of the order of Melchizedek. OK, I'm going to start this off once again with Acts chapter 13. And I'm going to pick up at verse, verse 13. And it reads, Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Shabbat day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Verse 16. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand, said, <clears throat> Salakia, Men of Israel, and ye that fear the Most High Power, Yahweh, give audience. Verse 17. The Most High Power, Yahweh, of this people, of Israel, Yahshua Allah, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And they 
Salaki, and with an high arm brought he them out of it. And about the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that he gave unto them judges about the space of four hundred and fifty years, until Samuel the prophet. And afterward they desired a king. And the Most High Power Yahweh gave unto them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony. I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath the Most High Power Yahweh, according to his promise, raised unto Yahshua Allah a Savior, Yahweh Shai. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feared the Most High Power Yahweh to you is the word of this salvation sent. So once again to the Israelites, bringing that point home. Verse 27. For they that dwell at Jerusalem, and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Shabbat day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But the Most High Power, Yahweh raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, the Most High Power, Yahweh, hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Yahweh Shai again. As it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Alright. Let that pass. Salakia. So Acts chapter 13, verse 34. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore, he saith also in another psalm, thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of the Most High Power, Yahweh, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom the Most High Power, Yahweh, raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Masha. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you, which is spoken of in the prophets, which is this verse right here, verse 41. Behold, ye despisers and wonder. And perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall not, it's so like a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. All right, so that's the point right there. All right, this is getting to our Lord Yahweh Shai, his importance, and how he links how Old Testament and New Testament testifies of our Lord. All right. Now, getting into how our Lord didn't see corruption, that goes into the topic of this epistle, which is the order of Melchizedek. So to get the origin about Melchizedek, <clears throat> let me go back to the book of Genesis, the 14th chapter, and I'm going to get it at the. I'm going to get it at the 18th verse. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, and it reads in Melchizedek, king of Salem brought forth bread and wine and he was the priest of the most high power all right now let's get this word for priest real quick mm, salakia okay so we have the hebrew word strong's h3548 where we have the ka the ha 
and the Na. So, Kahan, outline of biblical usage. Priest, principal officer or chief ruler. Priest king, such as Melchizedek and the Messiah. Pagan priest, priest of Yahweh, Levitical priest, Zadokite priests, Aaronite, so like Aaronic priests, or the high priest. Okay? So, we understand in this context, all right, it's talking specifically about, um, you know, it, this is basically the definition of priest, and it's letting you know the different contexts and the different types of priests there is. Okay? Uh, Strong's definition for Kahan, part active participle of Strong's H3547, literally one officiating, a priest, also by courtesy an acting priest, although a layman, chief ruler, own priest, prince, principal officer and once again hebrew child lexicon okay we got where's that definition at okay right here where it says right here around around about where it says joshua chapter 20 verse 6 says the high priest also who is called let me see ha kahan ha mashayach the anointed priest okay uh, Leviticus 4, 13. Kings who were also priests are mentioned in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. Okay, and that's talking about Melchizedek. Now, the point is, getting back to it, all right, Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High Power. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High Power, Yahweh, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed, it's like it, and blessed be the most high power, Yahweh, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Okay. So right here, we have it where Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Okay. He blessed Abraham and that blessing that he gave to Abraham. Okay. It's going to play out later on in a few uh, of these precepts I'm going to get. I laid on in the epistle, but let me go ahead and get the meaning of Melchizedek's name. <clears throat> okay, so we have the Hebrew word Strong's H forty four forty two, and that and it's beautiful because that number four represents mercy. Okay, so we have it's kind of different right here because of the way they got it, but I'll try to use the uh, this little glass magnifying glass thing to zoom in on it. So we have the Ma, the La. The Ka, and we have the Ya. So, Malachia, and right here, man, this thing is weird. Okay, so right here, the word that the first, it's so like the first character after the hyphen separates it. We have the Taza, we have the Da, and we have the Kwa. So, Malachia Tazadak, or Malak Tazadak. Outline the biblical usage. King of it says my king is Sedek, but understanding how the Hebrew words are and the breakdowns of it, right here, Strong's H4428 is Malak, which means king, messenger, or angel. And Tazadak, Strong's H66, so like it, 6664, means righteous. Okay, so Melchizedek is king of righteousness. Okay, outline of biblical usage a king of Salem and priest of the most high power to whom Abram paid tithes after the battle he fought to free Lot. The order of Melchizedek, the order of the priesthood to which Hamashiach belongs. Okay? And it actually goes deeper than that because if you can receive it, our Lord Yahweh Shai, he was Melchizedek. Okay? Now let me see if I can get that. All right. Malak Tazadak, king of righteousness. Melchizedek, king of Salem, which is Jerusalem, and priest of Yahweh. And it's also letting you know that it's mentioned in Psalms chapter 110, verse 4, which is where I was heading to next. Okay, Psalm chapter 110. And to add the context to it, I'm going to start at verse 1. And the subheading says the Lord Yahweh, and you see Lord in all caps, that's the Heavenly Father's proper name, Yahweh, which we got at the beginning of this epistle. The Lord Yahweh gives dominion to the king. But this lets you know that the Heavenly Father Yahweh, he's the sovereign Lord. He had, he's the one that rules everything. 
He's the one, as the scriptures let you know, he raises kings up and he makes them to fall. But Melchizedek, he's not a king that's going to fall. And I'm going to get that in later in later precepts as well. The Lord Yahweh said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. OK, so this right here was a question our Lord Yahweh Shai had asked some wicked Israelites. I believe it was the Pharisees or the Sadducees. I don't remember which one exactly, but he asked them, who is uh, David's Lord? And he was referring to this psalm right here. OK, so if you read it in the Hebrew, Psalm chapter one, verse 10 on the right hand side and the Lashuan Kadash, and it reads. La Dawada Ma Zamwar Naam Yahawa La Adanya Shab La Ya Manya Salakia La Ya Ma La Ya Ma Ya Naya <coughs> Salakia. I got that word mixed up. La La yam ya na ya, aid a shayath ayabyaka, and ayabyaka is your is a uh, thy enemies or your enemies. Hadam la ragalyaka. So, the main point of me reading that right there, salaki for the uh for the slip up, but let me get the word. Is right here. So we have the Heavenly Father's name, Yahweh. Okay, right there. That's the Lord in all caps. Then we have, so we have Yahweh, La Adanya. And Adanya, La Adanya is right here. So La meaning two, Adanya, Adan meaning Lord, and the Yah at the end makes it my Lord. So let's go to it. Okay. We have, where is it at? I passed it. Con. So, the Lord in all caps locks, proving all things. All right, once again, it's Strong's H3068, which you probably seen at the beginning of this epistle when I had the uh, the image up of the Heavenly Father's only begotten Son. Strong's H3068. We have the Yah, the Ha, the Wa. And at the end of the word, we have the ha. So Yahweh, outline of biblical usage, Yahweh, the existing one, meaning he is the proper name of the one true power. OK, so this is talking about the heavenly father. Now it says unto my Lord, this is David's Lord right here. And the Hebrew word being used is strongest H113. We have the ah, the da, the wa, and the na. So Adawan. Okay, outline of biblical usage, firm, strong, Lord, or master. Lord, master, reference to men, superintendent of household, of affairs, master, king, reference to the most high, the Lord, God, Lord of the whole earth. Now, the other definition, lords, kings, reference to men, it's like a proprietor of the hill of Samaria, master, husband, prophet, governor, prince, king. Okay. Uh, what else we have right here? My Lord, my master, reference to men, master, husband, prophet, prince, king, father. It has Masha, it has priest, theophanic angel, captain, general recognition of superiority. Reference to the most high, my Lord, my Lord and my power. Adonai, parallel with Yahweh. They have that false name right there. It's Yahweh. They had no E's in Hebrew. OK, but that word Adonai is also, I guess, you know, it's like Yiddish or something, but it's actually uh, Adonia. So Adawan also means Lord. And when you have Adonia, it means my Lord. OK, so this Lord right here is somebody that's subordinate to the Heavenly Father, Yahweh, but he's superior to King David. So who would this be referring to? This is talking about our Lord, Yahweh Shai. Now. Psalm chapter 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemy, so I thine enemies thy footstool. And I'm going to jump down to verse 2. The Lord shall send the rod of his, so the Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Tazayawan, which is Jerusalem. 
rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord Yahweh hath sworn he will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. And this is letting you know that our Lord Yahweh Shah is indeed coming back to judge these heathen nations that have had the children of Israel in captivity. Starting with Esau, Edom, the self-proclaimed so-called white man. The red Hebrew Edomite that also called the devil and Satan that the Bible speaks of. The spiritual Salaki, the physical incarnation of the spiritual demon Satan. Okay, and this is the nation of people that hates the children of Israel the most out of all the heathen nations. All of the heathen nations hate the children of Israel, but the Edomites are literally designed by the Heavenly Father, Yahweh, to hate us the most because they have to play the part of the wicked, the children of perdition. Okay. Now, verse seven, he shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore, shall he lift up the head. Right now, let's go to verse four, where it says a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Let's get after the order. So we have Strong's H seventeen hundred, and we have the Da, the Ba, the Ra, and the Ha. So the Ra and the Ha connect. So it'd be Da Ra. Outline of biblical usage: cause, manner, reason. And these, this is where it gets more interesting. KJV translation counts five times. The KJV translates Strong's H 1700 in the following manner. Cause one time, order one time, estate one time, end one time, regard one time. Strong's definition, Dabra, Dabra or Dabara, uh, feminine of Strong's H 1697, a reason suit or style cause and estate and that word estate is going to be key order regard okay <clears throat> and getting into the hebrew child lexicon it had uh let me see dabara but principally found in the later hebrew but see the occurrences Definition one says thing, i.e. manner or mode. Okay, thou art a priest forever, according to the manner of Melchizedek. Okay, so that means coming in the likeness of Melchizedek, the same office. All right, and when I got once again into the root word of Dabara, it goes back to the Hebrew word Dabar. Outline the biblical usage. Speech, word, speaking thing, speech, saying, utterance, word, words, business, occupation, acts, manner, so like it matter, case, something, manner by extension. And this was the interesting uh, part right here for me, because even with the root word, the bar, it gets into business, occupation, acts, matter, case, the, something or manner. OK, so. This Lord that King David was referring to, <clears throat> he also comes after he comes in the same business, occupation and acts as Melchizedek did. And what was Melchizedek also known for? He was known as the high. He was known as the priest of the most high power and the king of uh, Salem. And when you get that word Salem in the Hebrew, it's uh, Shalom, which means peace. So when you when you uh, add the Yara to it. Yerushalayim, that's teaching of peace. Okay, so this this um this Lord of David's is coming in the same manner as Melchizedek, and even deeper than that, he is indeed Melchizedek. So let me see if I can get that. Uh, what was that? It was a it was a specific precept. I know I had it in the sword. trying to remember Salakia. Let me see. I think it was in... Oh, con, con, con. It was the book of Hebrews chapter... 
Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. And it says Melchizedek priesthood, it's like Melchizedek's priesthood, like yeah, like Hamashiach's. Okay. And Hamashiach is the Hebrew word for the anointed. Okay, that's the title of our Lord Yahweh Shai. He's the anointed one of the Heavenly Father, Yahweh. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high power, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness. That's what Melchizedek means. And after that, also the king of Salem, which is king of peace. Okay. And right there where it says gave a tenth part of all, that's what the word tithe actually roots back to. It means a tenth part. Okay. A tenth part of whatever you have as far as, you know, your um, livestock or your riches, so forth and so on. You know, that's where the tithing system came from. It was before the Levitical priesthood. And this uh, chapter is going to get a little bit more into that. So for Jake's from Sakari talking about Yahweh Shah is going to pay, uh, what is that? What is what did Alazar say? They're gonna Yahweh Shah is gonna pay tithes to the Levitical priesthood. That's just that's blasphemy, man. It's bugged out. All right. Um, Hebrews chapter seven verse three. Without father, without mother, with so like it, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. And that was the point that I wanted to get right there. I need to bookmark that Slaki. But that was the point right there that I wanted to get. So this Lord that King David was talking about, he's going to come in the manner of Melchizedek after the order of Melchizedek. OK, and this is the key right here, because we know that Yahweh Shai, he's been made perfect. All right. He's immortal. He sits at the right hand side of the heavenly father, Yahweh. OK. And just like Melchizedek, our Lord Yahweh Shai, OK. Now he doesn't have an end to his life. And as Melchizedek, he just like uh, Elder Yashawama once said, he just appeared on the scene. OK, this is why he had neither father nor mother. All right. He appeared in his angelic in an angelic body. Now, as Yahweh Shai. OK. To fulfill a uh, prophecy, he later came through the, through the uh, lineage of Abraham. And of this uh, house of Judah, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Judah. To fulfill prophecy and this precept right here in um hebrews the seventh chapter it's going to get more into that as well now let me see if i can get it hebrews chapter 7 verse 4 now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch abraham gave the tenth of the spoils and verily they that are of the sons of levi who received the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law that is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. Verse six, but he who whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And these precepts are right here to let you know how great Melchizedek is and how his his priesthood is completely superior to the Levitical priesthood. All right. So a Jake saying that the Levitical priesthood is going to be having Yahweh Shai pay tithes to him is just completely fucking wicked. Hebrews chapter seven, verse seven. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And that right there gets into. um, It was something that I was looking into uh, just yesterday when it gets into covenants. I was looking up, uh, I think, one of the words for covenant. In the, in the Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, and it stated how um, when covenants are made, um, one, the one who um, is mightier than the other sets the terms of the covenant. You know, for example, the Heavenly Father, Yahweh, ma making the covenant with our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so forth and so on. And in this case, all right, Melchizedek, who was superior to uh, Abraham, okay, he had blessed Abraham on behalf of the Heavenly Father, Yahweh. Verse 8. And here, men that die receive tithes, talking about the Levitical priesthood, but there in the Melchizedek priesthood, he receiveth them of whom it is written that he, so like it, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth, right? Because once Yahweh Shai was um, crucified on the cross, okay, like our Lord says, 
after three days, I'll be made perfect, roughly paraphrasing. So our Lord, he was made perfect. All right. He's removed from the whole cycle of having to reincarnate and pay for the sins of the past life, so forth and so on. He's not bound by the flesh. He's perfect with the Heavenly Father, Yahweh. OK, he does. He's not bound by sin, meaning he's not able to die because sin is transgression of the law and the wages of sin is death. So this is part of the translation that we hope for. This is why we keep talking about the chariots and being delivered out of Babylon the Great. This is what the Heavenly Father, Yahweh Bashmi al revealed to us. And this is also written in the book of First Corinthians, the 15th chapter, starting at the 50th verse. OK, reading on Hebrews chapter seven, verse nine and also, so like it, and as I may so say, Levi also who received, so like it, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in his father's loins when Melchizedek met him. Okay, and that reminds me of you know how it is in the world sometimes. You know, Jacob be like, Hey, look, man, when we was doing this, you know, you was in your father's nutsack. So, you know, in righteousness, <laughs> you know, Yahweh Shah can easily brag and say, Look, man. If he wanted to, you know, if he wanted to, he could easily be like any of you Jakes that's talking about because you Levites and this and that, like Alazar, oh yeah, I'm a Levite, I'm chief priest, Levite, and you know, uh Yahweh Shah is gonna pay tithes to us in the kingdom. You bro, like that that just sounds <laughs> that just sounds completely ridiculous and arrogant. This precept literally cuts, and this is this this cuts all of the bullshit, and this is why Sakari doesn't like the uh, the book of Hebrews or doesn't consider they don't consider the writings of Paul authoritative. Well, I'm like, well, it's basically throwing out most of the New Testament, but they don't like it because these are the words of the Lord that can, that cuts through their bullshit. And it basically exposes them as liars. And this wasn't about getting on Sakari. But once again, the scripture says, mark them that cause divisions and contrary to the doctrine, which you've learned and avoid them. All right. So it's just the spirit. But point is, Levi was literally in his father, Abraham's loins and Abraham, you know, when it says father, line upon line precept upon precept it doesn't always mean your immediate father because levi was the uh levi was the great grandson of abraham but the point is that's how that's even more reason like before levi was even physically before levi's father jacob was even conceived abraham had paid these tithes to melchizedek he had paid tithes to a superior priesthood and received a blessing from that superior priesthood so the melchizedek priesthood it predates the levitical priesthood the Levitical priesthood was a shadow of the, the perfect priesthood of the heavens. OK. And I think the book of uh, Hebrews, the ninth chapter gets into that. But for time's sake, I'm going to keep reading out of this right here. Hebrews chapter seven, verse. Mm, verse nine, and it reads, and also so like it. And as I may so say, Levi also who received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in his father's, so like he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. There, so like if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? And once again, uh, and this is a good reason to why help us me on shy for putting the spirit of me for getting that word for priest early. The, the word priest Kahan, it also gets into uh, priests and high priests because in the Levitical priesthood, you had uh, the priests from the different um, families of Levi, which would be, I think, the, the who was that the Kohathites, the Merorites and the Gershonites. And those three different classes of priests had different duties. I think one was responsible for uh, handling the ark, one was responsible for incense, so forth and so on. But you had the high priest that had to come from not just the family of Kohath, but specifically within the family of Kohath from the house of Aaron, because Aaron and Moses, they came from a Kohath's line because Levi had three sons. So it was Kohath, Merari and uh, Gershon. And Kohath, he was the uh, the forefather of Abraham. It's like it, the forefather of Moses and Aaron, and the heavenly father Yahweh under the Levitical priesthood. He chose his, he chose Aaron and his descendants to be um, high priests. So anybody that came out of Aaron's line was eligible to be high priest under the, under the Levitical priesthood. But the point of this precept is letting you know the order of Aaron is being mentioned because this is letting you know that Melchizedek. <clears throat> He is he's high priest. OK, and those are underneath Melchizedek, 
would be his priests. So this is going back once again into the law. Okay. And this is going to be fulfilled in the kingdom. Exodus chapter 19. Verse 3. And Masha went up unto the Most High. And the Lord Yahweh called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say, uh, it, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. And here's the point, verse 6. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Masha came, like, and Masha came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord Yahweh commanded him. Okay. Verse 8. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord Yahweh hath spoken, we will do. And Masha returned the words of the people unto the Lord Yahweh. Okay, so right there, we understand through history and through the, uh, the scriptures, the history that's in the scriptures, that our people, they didn't fulfill their end of the bargain. Now, this is going to play out again when Lord Yahweh Shah returns, but it's actually going to be fulfilled this time because we'll be made perfect. The elect, first and foremost, Adawan Ratazal, we be of that number. Now, the two thirds will be destroyed on this side and learn the same thing we learned after death by pain, though. Because they're not going to repent and turn back to the Heavenly Father, Yahweh, through His only begotten Son, Yahweh Shah. They don't want to be priests. They don't want anything to do with our culture. They want Babylon. They want spiritual Sodom and Egypt. So, once again, the Lord is saying, you know, the Lord is going to destroy these, these modern day Egyptians, these spiritual Egyptians, these Edomites. <clears throat> So like in a worse of fashion than he did ancient Egypt. He's going to destroy them in a worse of fashion than he did ancient Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> All right. Now, that being said, okay, why is this? It has to be this way because, once again, two thirds of our people won't repent. They won't accept Yahweh Shai as their Lord and Savior. Okay. Now, I know that that's a, a, it sounds like a cliche because the Christian church has overused it. But once again, we're taking back everything that these false prophets have stolen. Lord, Lord Yahweh Shah is indeed the Lord and Savior of the house of Israel. What about the heathen nations? They're his subjects. And by extension, the subjects of the children of Israel. That's why they were cre created. They weren't created to be saved from oppression they are the ones oppressing the children of israel that's what salvation was always about israel saying they would obey the lord and then falling off worshiping the gods of these heathen the heathen are the problem so why the hell would the lord save them the heathen are one are part of the problem salakia the other part is israel being in the flesh and choosing the flesh over the spirit of yahweh bashmi al shai okay and being sold to do mischief among the heathen and then when he offers repentance to them they they turn their neck away they harden their hearts and they don't want to repent. The Lord's not dealing with that. But those are the nation of Israel because the Lord has everlasting mercy. He's not going to keep judging all of the nation as a unit anymore. Because the one third always had to get judged with the two thirds. Now the Lord, he's saying, no, nah, none of that. The elect, the one third is going to be saved, starting with the 144,000, which are 12,000 mighty men out of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. And then underneath that will be the other men of the one third, as well as the women and children that believe. The two thirds are going to be destroyed on this side. They're going to get the same judgment as the heathen because they don't want to be reconciled back unto the Heavenly Father, Yahweh. They want to still stay under the status of being Nakarium, which means strangers, actual foreigners. Even though by blood they're still Israelites, but on this side they got to get the foreigner treatment. They got to get the heathen treatment, which is destruction. But right here, the point is in verse six, the Lord is saying to all 12 tribes, they shall be a holy nation. There shall be unto him as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Holy men is set apart. And we understand what priests do. OK. Priests minister unto the heavenly father, Yahweh. They do his service. OK. 
Let me go back to the word priest again. Okay. Getting more into the duties. Anointed priest, interpret several places. Kings, David, you had the king. Interpretation. Priest. Priest. Uh, ready to be understood. Although, no, try to leave. Uh, principal minister to the king. Okay, come on. Here we go. Okay, I can't really, uh, you know, the Hebrew child lexicon on this app doesn't let me highlight anything. I can't even really zoom in like that. Oh, yeah, I can zoom in, but I can't highlight anything. But anyway, right here where it says First Chronicles 18 and 17, it says, And the sons of David were chief about the king, i.e. principal ministers of the kingdom. Right. So the priests do religious duties for Yahweh Bashmi al Shah. Okay. This is why when you get into the book of Isaiah, the 61st chapter, and this, this entire chapter, I recommend brothers new to the faith read because it'll definitely boost your spirits and get you into understanding what we're actually looking forward to. So this is the book of Isaiah chapter 61. I'm going to start at verse 1. And the subheading says, Exaltation of the afflicted. The spirit of the Lord Yahweh is upon me because the Lord Yahweh hath preached, so I have anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord Yahweh and the day of vengeance of our power, to comfort all that mourn. And right there you see the word good tidings. Okay, that word gets into where you, it, it also ties into gospel. Okay, good tidings. That word ties in the gospel. So this lets you know that the gospel is for the Israelites. Old Testament, Apocrypha, and New Testament. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, which is a people before us a place. It's another word for Jerusalem, which is also a people before us a place. That's the capital city of the Israelites. So wherever the Israelites are, you know, especially those that serve Yahweh Bashmi al Shad, that's where Zion is. It starts with the people, and when the people in their right uh, mind, when they serve Yahweh Bashmi al Shai, then they build the city. Reading on, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord Yahweh, that he might be glorified. Okay? Another also, you know, sidebar, that's another precept in which the Heavenly Father likens a nation of people unto trees. Verse four, and they shall build the old wastes. They shall raise up the former desolations and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations and strangers shall stand and feed your flocks and the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. And this right here lets you know that this isn't talking about Israelites. This is talking about heathen specifically because the key word is the uh, Hebrew word right here, Nakar. And that goes back into that word I mentioned earlier, that two thirds of our people want to be in the car. OK. Let me go to it. The alien. OK. So we have the Hebrew word Strong's 52 Strong's H52 Salakia Strong's H5236. We have the Na, the Ka. And the Ra, the car outline of biblical usage, foreign alien. How does that? Salakia. Foreign alien, foreignness, that which is foreign. Foreignness, foreign gods, alien, foreigner, foreign vanities. Okay. Strong's definition, the car from Strong's H5234. Uh, foreign or concretely a foreigner or abstractly heathendom. Alien, strange or stranger. So this is talking about heathen, specifically the heathen nations. All right. There's 18 biblical nations. With amongst them, there's one chosen nation, which is the Israelites, the, he the Heavenly Father's chosen people. Then the other 17 nations are all heathen from your Edomites, your Moabites, Ammonites, Ishmaelites, uh, Canaanites, your Puttites, which would be, you know, the so-called uh, Libyans. All right. Got Montezarium, which is the so-called Egyptians, the Cushites, the so-called Ethiopians. All right. All of these different nations. They're all heathen. So the Lord is saying, yes, the children of Israel will have them as their plowmen and vine dressers, our servants, our slaves. And when you get that word for Icar, 
another one of my favorites, Strong's H406. In the Hebrew, it's actually where we have the ah, the ka, and the ra. So instead of i car, it's actually ah car. Outline of biblical usage plowman, husbandman, farmer. But here's the point working the land, yet owning, yet not owning any of it. So, yes, that's why you can also understand that this is not talking about us enslaving other Israelites or even having other Israelites as servants. This is talking about um, the heathen because there's laws for how Hebrews deal amongst each other. If one Hebrew is serving another Hebrew, the year of release, so forth and so on, and how we can't rule over each other with rigor. But with the heathen, we can. And that's what they're made for. Thus said the Lord, thus said the scriptures, thus said the Holy Bible that you people claim that you love and that you believe and you know okay now here's the point isaiah chapter 61 verse 5 and strangers shall stand and feed your flocks and the son of the alien shall be your plowman and your vine dressers but ye shall be named the priests of the lord yahweh men shall call you the ministers of our power ye shall eat the riches of the gentiles and in their glory ye shall boast yourselves right because what the priest of the most high this also gets into how the law of uh the bible the thawara all right that's going to be the law of creation in the kingdom of heaven when new jerusalem comes down from heaven and sets up the order the king the, uh, it's like the throne of david with yahweh shot as our king and the 12 apostles directly underneath him and the rest of the 144,000 as the governing body all right we will be priests of the heavenly father we all know the law perfectly and the heathen, they'll still go off because they'll still be in the flesh. So what's going to have to happen? They're going to get punished when they go off. Everybody's going to be re-educated in the ways of Yahweh Ba'ashem Yahushah, but they won't be able to partake in the blessings the way that we do. Will they be blessed? Sure. You know, like Elder Yahshua says when he gets into, um, when he does his breakdowns on this topic, they'll be blessed by having, to, by being able to partake in a righteous rulership, being able to drink actual water, being able to, you know, breathe fresh air being able to eat real food and not putting every daggone animal that crawls and creeps in in their mouth eating abominations and make and also messing up the earth while you do it because the lord has a specific order that he set up for the creation and the heathen nations they don't honor it you know the heathen being able to run things is a, it's a um it's a disease to the earth especially esau eating the self-proclaimed so-called white man which is why he's called the basis of men. Okay. So the priests of Yahweh Bashmi Al Shah are gonna know the law perfectly. And the pre and the one of my beautiful, it's like not beautiful. One of the favorite precepts that I have that's real beautiful for this topic is right here in Hebrews, the eighth chapter. Get into the new covenant. And I'm going to get right to the point. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, and it reads, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a sorry, and I will be to them a power, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. Like we're doing now, we go out to the highways and the byways, we do video pistols, and we teach our people because they don't know that they're Israelites. We have to re-educate our people through the spirit and power of Yahweh Bashem Al Shai of their true nationality, of their true heritage, and the responsibilities they have as the children of the Heavenly Father. They don't know it right now. Reading on, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. And this is only amongst the Israelites. Okay. Verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Right. Because through Yahweh Shah's blood, all of that's going to be cleansed away and will be made priests after the order of Melchizedek. Every single Israelite will know the law perfectly. Okay. But the very elect, which would be the 144,000. All right. These, this will be the ruling body of the nation of Israel over the heathen. Okay. So if all Israel will know the law, the difference between the 144,000 and the rest of the one third is that the 144,000 will be the ruling body 
okay, directly underneath Hamashiach Yahweh Shai, whom the Rugman calls Jesus Christ. His name is Yahweh Shai. And he is also Melchizedek, king of uh, righteousness. He's that high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And this is letting you know that the order of Melchizedek, that will be the priesthood that is um, implemented on earth. It won't be the Levitical priesthood. Because under the Levitical priesthood, only the tribe of Levi can be priests. But even in the law, okay, the Lord is telling us through the prophet Masha, who was a Levite, that all of us will be a nation of a kingdom of uh, Slakia. I'll go back to it. I always get the words mixed up. Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And what also makes us holy is the fact that, you know, that word holy gets in the set apart. The Hebrew word kodash, okay, right there, just to make it quick. The Hebrew word kodash and holy means set apart. One of the things that makes us set apart is that the Lord is only dealing with us in the way in which he's dealing. He's not giving immortality to the other heathen nations. He's not giving them bodies where they can perfectly keep the law, statutes, and commandments. He's not giving them spiritual power. Okay, so we have... Strong's 869.18, where we have the Kwa, the Da, the Wa, and the Sha. So, Kwa Dash. Outline the biblical usage. Sacred, Holy One. It's like it. Sacred, Holy, Holy One, Saint set apart. Also letting you know that the saints are the Israelites. They're, they're, we're the nation that's set apart. Okay. And one more time, I'm going to get this, the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6. And it reads, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty Power, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And this is where IUIC and other individuals just start teaching false doctrines or getting bugged out and tripped up, especially vocab Malone. When it says the mighty God, you know, in English, they don't understand. They don't get into the Hebrew. That word God goes back into the Hebrew word uh, Allah, which means power. And Allah Hayyam, that's the plural. That means powers. So that's multiple angels, rulers, judges, divine ones or magistrates. So our Lord Yahweh Shai, yes, he is a God. But he's not the most high God. He's the only begotten son of the most high God. That's why right here you see God in capital G, but lowercase O D. And you know, individuals bug out. Okay. Now, verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord, Yahweh Tazabah Wath, will perform this. And that Lord in all caps locks, once again, is the Heavenly Father, Yahweh's name. Okay, so this is telling you the Lord, Yahweh, is going to give this um, power and authority to Yahweh Shai, who is also Melchizedek. He's going to give him an eternal kingdom and government and peace that won't have an end to it. Just like Melchizedek's life doesn't have an end to it. And those that receive in that blessing, those that are made like unto Melchizedek, that become priests after his order, will be partakers of his rulership. So we won't have an end to our life, to our peace, to our power. And let me go back into another precept that gets into that. Uh... The promise. Second Samuel chapter seven. And okay, come. On. I'll start right here, verse eight. Second Samuel chapter seven, verse eight. And it says the most high's covenant with David. And it reads, Now therefore say it's like it. Now therefore so shalt thou say unto my servant David. Thus saith the Lord Yahweh Tazabah Wath, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, 
and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight and have made thee a great name like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people, Yasha Allah, meaning he is a prince of the power, and will plant them that they may dwell in the land of their own and no Salaki and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And the children of wickedness are as the heathen nations, but chiefly Esau Edom, the self proclaimed so called white man. Because these heathen nations, they worship strange, uh, strange gods, idols. All right. And those idols are nothing. But the issue is the uh, the disgusting practices that come with these idols from the unclean foods to the weird sexual rituals to the, the, the baby deletions. OK, all of these different things and the children of Israel doing it, 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 it ruins us. You know, and us following their ways, the Lord puts us in the captivity. And with the captivities going into slavery under these heathens also comes scattering. Because when you put somebody in slavery, you can do whatever you want to them, especially these lawless heathen. We we have laws and regulations amongst our um, when it comes to slavery. You can get the scriptures on that. All right. In the ancient times, even if a man, you know, we, we put an enemy nation to death and we took their women as concubines, we couldn't. And we, you know, we couldn't even sell them to another nation. If I remember that precept correctly, let me do a quick little segue, Salakia. You know, let me see. Where is it at? Con. All right. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 10. And it reads, when thou goest forth to war against thine enemies, and the Lord Yahweh Allah hath delivered them into thine hand, and thou hast taken them captives, and seeth among the captives a beautiful woman, and hast a desire unto her, that thou wouldest have her to thy wife, then thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and she shall shave her head and pare her nails. And she shall put the raiment, it's like, and she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off of her, and she shall remain in thine house, and bewail her father and her mother a full month. And after that, thou shalt go in unto her, and be her husband, and she shall be thy wife. And it, it shall be, if thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go whither she will, but thou shalt not sell her at all for money. Thou shalt not make merchandise of her, because thou hast humbled her. Now, it may seem like a, um, I didn't want to segue this far, but through the spirit, I'm remembering how this actually ties back into the epistle. Because once again, our people were scattered by not following the law, statutes and commandments. We needed Yahweh Shai's salvation. We went, in, we went into captivity and part of the captivity and being slaves under the heathen who don't have these laws is that if they take our women and they make them concubines, they don't have a law saying that they can't sell them. This is why the Lord, he's telling us he's, we're holy for many different reasons. If we go right, the heathen go left. There was nothing stopping the heathen from selling our women. You know, if they, if they took our women as concubines and they got tired of them, it was nothing stopping them from selling them, selling her to another nation. Like, I don't know, like 10 countries away. You can look into the Ottoman Empire. They was good for that. Those Ishmaelites. So that's why, you know, through the spirit, the Wadi Halbash Shah, you know, I was able to get this precept. But yeah, and our law, we can't, you know, even amongst the heathen, we got rules and regulations. You know, that's all through the spirit and probably how about me on shot. The Lord is righteous. OK. And this once again, this is talking about, you know, a concubine, so forth and so on, because a concubine is a lower status wife. Now, when it comes to the prophecy of Joel, the third chapter, yes, we can sell the heathens. We can sell man, male and female heathens wherever the hell we want to sell them. You know, but this is talking about once you done made a, a heathen woman your wife, meaning your concubine, that you know there's a way, there's responsibility that comes with that. Okay. Uh, let me see what else I have right here. Going back to the promise, uh, Second Samuel chapter seven, verse. Uh, I'll pick back up at verse ten. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them. It's like it. And we'll plant them once again, treating us like trees. You know, this is a beautiful comparison. All right. Or the Lord is likening us unto trees. 
that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord Yahweh telleth thee that he will make thee in house. And when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt like it, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, meaning pass away and go to the grave. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. So this means that this king will come out of King David's uh, lineage. OK, he will come directly from King David's loins. He shall build an house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Now, for those that say that this was King Solomon, King Solomon went off. Sure, but he wasn't beaten with the rod of men or chastened with the stripes of the children of men. King Solomon died in his old age. But since reincarnation is biblical, OK, that same spirit that was called King Solomon in that time came back as Yahweh Shai in his family's lineage. Every, you know, we all come back in our family, our family's lineage every three and four generations. So generations down the line from there. OK, he came back as Yahweh Shai, born to Joseph, who was his biological father, keeping the, the lineage of King David interrupted because the promise had to be made. And, you know, it's like not made the promise was kept by the Heavenly Father, Yahweh, because the Lord, he sworn by his name and he and he does not he don't change his mind. OK, so Yahweh Shai, he was beaten for the sins he committed as Adam and as King Solomon and for the remission of the sins of the nation of Israel. Now, read on verse 15. This is the point. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak to David. So that was the promise that the Heavenly Father Yahweh made to King David through the, uh, the prophet Nathan. And this promise is being fulfilled. It's going to be in full uh, effect once Yahweh Shah returns. On that fathership, which is you know, that gigantic chariot of the Lord, which Esau calls a so-called UFO. All right. With the, uh, the rest of the holy angels, <laughs> Michael and so forth. But he's Melchizedek. All right. The king of peace. Let me see the time of life. Uh, let me see. I think it was this precept. Um... Saint, perpetual order. Okay, that was that. It's a lock in. Okay, now getting back into how um, we'll be part of what Melchizedek has going on, let's get the book of Romans, chapter 8. Romans, chapter 8. And I'm going I'm to hit I'm going to hit this quick point right here and get to the other point. Romans chapter eight, verse eight. Oh, Salakia. Romans chapter eight, verse five. And it reads, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Right. And that's what the difference between the Israelites and the heathen are. The heathen, no matter what, how fancy their religion looks or what their worship may be, they're naturally carnally minded. All right. This is why the Lord says that they're, they're less than nothing in vanity. And what's one of the main vain things the Heavenly Father hates? Idolatry, worshiping false gods, these idols and the heathen. That's their main staple, worshiping false gods. All right. Now, let's see what else I got right here. Um, but the children of Israel, you know, the issue with us is we have a, a certain battle to, um, to have to play out. We got to, you know, walk in the spirit so it's not to fulfill the lust of the flesh. We, we, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We have the battle between choosing the spirit over the flesh constantly. 
All right, the heathen, the Lord, has, he hasn't given them that battle. They're, just, they're brute beasts. He's not dealing with them. He didn't make them to be that deep. Romans chapter 8, verse 6, for to be calmly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Right, because when we commit, when we uh, think about the carnal stuff, that's how we commit sin against the Lord. And sin is the transgression of the law, and the wages of sin is death. If you commit a sin, you have to be put to death. And it doesn't always mean the Lord's going to delete you brutally, you know, but you will catch hell. You'll catch diseases. You'll be financially burdened. You'll have issues with women. And for the sisters, you will have an issue finding a man, you know, a number of different things, you know, and then ultimately one way or the other, you still have to pass away of old age. If the Lord doesn't delete you, you're going to pass away at the very least of old age. And that's not how the children of Israel are supposed to be. So Yahweh Shah is going to correct that. Romans chapter 8, verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against the most high power Yahweh, for it is not subject to the law of the most high power Yahweh, neither indeed can be so they that are in the flesh cannot please the most high power yahweh and that goes deep man that goes into everything this is why when brothers or elders make videos about how you uh black only israelites are going to be destroyed they ain't saying that just to be saying that it goes back to the scriptures because you're you're judging our people and everything else you're judging all people based off of carnality the lord doesn't deal with carnality he deals with the spirit. This is why you're exhorted to build yourself up in the spirit so you can actually have a chance of knowing what the fuck you're talking about. But you don't do that. And that's just in judging our Israelite foreigner brothers and sisters, not to mention how dumb you are when it comes to you trusting your enemy. You got individuals that you will invite around you because they look blackety black, but they're Edomites or they could easy, easily be Hamites. Romans chapter 8 verse 9 and it reads but ye are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of the most high power Yahweh dwell in you now if any man have not the spirit of Hamashiach he is none of his okay now getting back into the uh the main point verse 10 if Hamashiach so like and if Hamashiach be in you the body is dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness okay so yahweh shy dealing with us is how even though we commit sin you know if we continue and we show a broken spirit and contrite heart we give diligence to make our call election sure and we sincerely want to serve yahweh bashmi al shah he'll have mercy on us through yahweh shy and he'll continue to deal with us and guide us in this walk he and basically that's how the lord's blood the lord yahweh shah's blood covers our sins Verse 11, but if the spirit of him that raised up Yahweh Shai, which is the most high power Yahweh, from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Hamashiach from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Right. Despite the fact we got these weak fleshly bodies that sin, that have stupid, wicked thoughts, the heavenly father Yahweh, he's going to quicken us. He's going to give us the ability to be sharp in the spirit and move the way we need to, that we can please him, that we can to the best of our ability, choose the righteous, uh, make righteous decisions and offend less uh, day to day. It's a lot in moment to moment. OK, now let me get back into it uh, and get into the point. Romans chapter eight, verse 16. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of the most high power, Yahweh. And this is talking about the elect first and foremost, because the two thirds, they won't repent. They're rejecting the Lord. So he's going to destroy them. Verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of the most high power, Yahweh, and joint heirs with Hamashayak. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be gl also glorified together. Okay. So how are we going to be glorified together with Hamashayak, Yahweh Shai? By being translated, by having our mortal bodies changed the same way his body is changed, an extraterrestrial body. He has a spiritual body that's able to interact with the physical. So we'll have the spiritual powers that angels have, but on a higher level, okay? But we'll still be able to interact because angels, they don't come down to earth and they don't have sex with women. Contrary to that weird, uh, that false Genesis chapter six breakdown about the sons of God going to the daughters of men and making giants. No, now in the kingdom, this will be done because the children, the children of Israel will have spiritual bodies of spiritual power. Being able to perfectly keep the law of Yahweh Bashmiel Shah so we won't be able to pass away and, and be put to death anymore. Okay. 
but we'll still be able to enjoy physical pleasures like eating the food we like, drinking the stuff we like to drink, all right, and having sex. Simple. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of the most high power, Yahweh. And creature just means a creation, like whatever you make. And this particular creature is talking about, okay, um, oh, Salakia, verse 20. I'm getting ahead of myself. Romans chapter 8, verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who have subjected the same in hope. And this creature right here is talking about the Israelites, the whole nation of Israel. We were created by the heavenly father, Yahweh, and he made us to go off. All right. Not to destroy us, but so we can actually uh, learn righteousness so we can appreciate righteousness and um, abhor wickedness so we can hate wickedness. So by the time the heavenly father, Yahweh sends Yahweh shot back <clears throat> and he beams up the elect, we'll understand completely just how disgusting wickedness is and why the heavenly father's ways is perfect. OK. Verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the li glorious liberty of the children of the most high power, Yahweh. Right. <clears throat> so we'll be delivered from having to pass away because we committed a sin or the consequences that come from the other sins that we commit being in subject, being subject under the heathen, so forth and so on. Romans chapter 8, verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Right. So. Going back to what I said earlier, the heathen, they won't be blessed like we will be blessed, but they'll be blessed by being able to actually enjoy the uh, the benefits of being under a righteous rulership, being able to eat real food, drink real water and not being up under Esau's weirdo, his little weirdo uh, activities and decrees and all these other things that everybody has to deal with because Esau's in rulership. So whether the heathen like us or not, we don't care about them liking us. The simple fact is their way doesn't work. You know, like uh, people say in the world, like, you know, sir, you know, you're not that guy. There's oftentimes that even in the, in the ministry, you know, you see that there's individuals from different camps that have to be told they're not that guy. And you how about you shy? If he gets pissed off, he has to show them in a harsh way that they're not that guy. So this is why being humble is very important. And the Heavenly Father, how about you shy? He's not going to humble the heathen the way he humbles his children. He's going to humble them in a way worse away. That's going to be a thousand years of hard bondage to get those weird customs out of them. And then they're going to have to obey the law, statutes, and commandments of Yahweh Bashmi al Shai. And if they go off, they'll be punished. Yahweh Shai's blood is not covering the heathen. Now, one last precept, and I'm going to wrap it up. This is the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. Uh, and I'm going to jump around a little bit right here. So. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to start at verse 11. Therefore, whether it it's like, therefore, whether it were I or or they, so we preach and so ye believed. Now, if Hamashiach be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? <clears throat> right. So this is basically, you know, getting into how you know, how can you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? Yahweh Shai rose from the dead. Okay? And he had witnesses that he rose from the dead, which which is what I brought out in the book of Acts, the 13th chapter, where it said he had uh, people that was that he was seen of in Galilee in Jerusalem. Verse 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Hamashiach not risen? And if Hamashiach be not risen, then is our preaching in vain? And your faith is also in vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of the most high power because we have testified of the most high power, Yahweh, that he raised up Hamashiach, whom he raised not up. If so be that he, so like, if so be that the dead rise not. Right. So Lord Yahweh Shah was indeed risen from the dead. And there's even Old Testament accounts of people being risen from the dead in Israel when uh, I believe that the prophet Elijah or I think Elisha. Uh, raised that woman's son from the dead, okay, through the spirit and power of Yahweh Bashmi al Shah. So, once again, this goes back into do you believe? And once you believe, you know, are you gonna um, 
Are you going to study the truth of self approve? Are you going to get wisdom, knowledge, and understanding? Because understanding the Heavenly Father, Yahweh, he doesn't make promises and go back on them based off of, you know, <clears throat> the limited understanding of, of a mortal mind. If you can't understand how, if you just because you can't resurrect a person from the dead doesn't mean Yahweh Bosh Miao Shai can't. So if he said that he, that the scripture says that he won't suffer his Holy One to see corruption, then yes. Yahweh Shai is that Holy One. He didn't, he lived a life of no sin as Yahweh Shai. So he was able, he was kind of worthy of all these things. He fulfilled the promises that the Heavenly Father Yahweh was talking about. He laid down his life so he can pick it up again. And those that are joined unto him, he's going to give us the same. So let's get this right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. But now is Hamashiach risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. And that's the beauty of the scriptures because the Heavenly Father, Yahweh, once again, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1. A false balance is abomination to the Lord, Yahweh, but a just weight is his delight. Right. So if he loves the nation of Israel, but first and foremost, because the Lord, he, he he's a, um, a power of his word. Because his word can't be broken. One. And two, because he loved the nation of Israel, if he create, if we have to uh, be put to death for sinning, then it would make sense that on the opposite end of the spectrum, because that's how balance works. It would make sense that he would have a way of redeeming us so that we can come back to life. <clears throat> because if we were if we were once <clears throat> Salakia, in a perfect immortal state and we fail because of sin. Then it would only make sense that Heavenly Father Yahweh has a way of returning us back unto that original estate. And that's through Hamashiach Yahweh Shai. Verse, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Hamashiach shall all be made alive. And this is because that same spirit that was in Adam is the same spirit that was in Yahweh Shai. Adam was Yahweh Shai as well. That's why that's said. Okay. Let me see. Um, I'm going to try to get that real quick. Quickening. Spirit. Okay. It's still in the same chapter. Salakia. I'll go back. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 23. But every man in his own order. Hamashiach. The first fruits. Afterward, they that are Hamashiachs at his coming. All right. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of the Most High. It's like the kingdom to the Most High Power, Yahweh. Even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Meaning no more heathen rulerships. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Because Israelites won't be able to perish. Israelites will also be just like Lord Yahweh Shai is living proof that death has been conquered. Every single Israelite will be living proof that death has been conquered. But no one will be able to partake in that on earth except the Israelites. That's the only nation that immortality has been opened up to. And we're the only nation that's been given the understanding of it. Through the spirit and power of Yahweh Shai. OK, verse 27, first Corinthians chapter 15, verse 27, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. Right. So basically, this is saying that once Lord Yahweh Shah puts all things under his feet. OK, the only thing that won't be up under uh, Yahweh Shah's rule is the heavenly father, Yahweh. OK, the one that gave him the power. Verse 28, and when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that the most high power, Yahweh, may be all in all. There it goes. OK, now let's see. Let's see what I can do. Um, it should be. Just had it. Okay. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 40. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, meaning heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Verse 41, there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the, re is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. So there you go. The Lord, he didn't just put us in an immortal state, put us in a mortal state. And didn't make a way for us to come back to that immortal state. Yahweh Shai is that way back. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 43. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Verse 44. It is sown in a natural body. And here's the point. It is raised in a spiritual body. Man, there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. OK, us as uh, us Israelites being in this natural body, meaning made by these physical elements. OK, we're limited. Our brethren, the angels being in the spiritual bodies, they kept the first estate. They're, they're not limited the way we are. This is why they can do things that, that doesn't make what you would call, by what Esau would call logical sense. This is why one angel can kill 85,000 highly trained elite heathen soldiers. And I'm referring to the account where the, heaven, where the Heavenly Father sent the angel of the Lord to kill 85,000 Assyrian soldiers. This is why one angel can decimate, uh, I think about, what was that, 75,000 Israelites because the Lord was angry with Israel. When he uh, put the spirit of Satan on, he put the spirit of on the spirit of Satan on King David to number Israel. This is why these things can happen. OK. Verse 45. So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. OK. How be it that was not first which is spiritual but that which is natural and afterward that which is spiritual <clears throat> so lock it so that's talking about how the first adam we had all right was made after you know a carnal ordinance his body was physical but the lord uh breathed life into him and made him a living soul and that that breath of life was the the law statutes and commandments you know, back then they didn't have the the uh, the Thawara, the Torah written down. It just was a way they walked. OK, but being in the flesh, he was still capable of going off, despite the fact that unlike us nowadays, we have to write it down. You know, the Bible is codified. We have this chapter, this verse, this, there, this, that. Nah, you know, and even, you know, in Moses time, you know, it was just written. It was just read out. But even before that, in Adam's time. It, it was just a way that you walked. You didn't need it written down. You just did it. But even with all that, because of the flesh, we still fail. So the ultimate glory was always going to come through Yahweh Shai, through that same, through uh, the same spirit that was in Adam, which is Yahweh Shai being perfected and him leading us on the way. This is why another reason he's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one that shows us, you know, where we went wrong. And he's the one that shows us how we can get right with the Heavenly Father, Yahweh. First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse. 46, how be it that was not first, which is spiritual, but which is socky, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Right. So once again, getting into Yahweh Shai and both of his incarnations. OK, this is why our Lord is the first and the last. OK. Verse 49. Oh, verse 48. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 48. As is the earthy, 
such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they that are so like it, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Amen. And that's the beauty. That's what we're looking for. We're trying to get that heavenly image. The Lord put us in this um this flesh, like the elder apostle said, elder high priest Jaikwab used to say, the heavenly father, he made us. He said we had to experience wickedness so we could appreciate righteousness, you know. So basically we doing it all. And this reminds me of that precept that says um, Esau was a cunning hunter and a man of the field. But Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And that word plain, you got to get into the Hebrew. That word plain is actually the Hebrew word thumb, which means perfect, not lacking in uh, morality, physical strength, beauty, etc. You know, so Jacob was balanced. Like it wasn't to say he couldn't be a man of the field. You know, he was a shepherd, you know, that's, that's backbreaking work. You know, he uh, worked under Laban, so forth and so on, and he even wrestled an angel for the blessing. So it wasn't the fact that he couldn't do it, but our forefather Jacob, he was well-rounded. Okay, so likewise, us as his children, the children of Israel, all right, we are going to be well-rounded, not just physically, but spiritually. We're going to go through all the worst things that, we could, that a, a nation could possibly go through, and we're going to experience all the best things a nation can possibly experience. All through the spirit and power of Yahweh Bashmi Al Shah. Now here's the point right here, and I can wrap it up. Verse 15, it's like it. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. The mystery of resurrection. And the sub it says that now in verse 50 says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of the most high power Yahweh. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So you would think, okay, so how do we get into the kingdom? The Lord says that we can't inherit. You know, we, we can't flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom. I'm flesh and blood. So does that mean I, I got to die to go to the kingdom? Not necessarily. Now, there will be some being martyred, but the kingdom won't be in the Christian sense. It won't be like, oh, you, you pass away and you go to heaven in the sky. No, it's going to be here on earth. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. And it reads, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the, it's like at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to the Most High Power, Yahweh, which gives us the victory through our Lord, Yahweh Shai Hamashiach. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. So that's what it is right there. Lord Yahweh Shai is going to come back and give us that same uh, body that he had as Melchizedek. All right. That perfected body that's able to uh, inhabit, you know, the, uh, the physical while still having spiritual authority and power. And able to indulge in the physical. Okay, because angels, when they're sent here, they can't do what we do. They can't have sex and all this other type of stuff. That's not their job. They don't indulge in the pleasures that we that we indulge in. All right. Once Yahweh Shah perfects us, we'll be able to indulge in these pleasures without them being a snare and a thorn unto us. Because yeah, you can get a woman here, but she might become a demon. She might start taking you for child support. She might commit adultery. You can get money here, but you're gonna get taxed. You can own a house, but you can have a, a dag on a, a, a quote unquote a act. It's like you're not a quote unquote, but an act of the most high happen. You know, your house could get hit by a dag on storm or something while you're out of town. Anything could happen. OK, but once your house perfects us, that's the Lord putting away all of our iniquity from before him. So we'll be able to enjoy all of the good things he had in store for, for us since before our inception. But that's all I have for this epistle. Hopefully this lesson was edifying and exhorting to the elect of the nation of Israel, to the hopeful elect of the nation of Israel. Once again, I want to give all praises, honor, and glory to our beloved Heavenly Father and His only begotten Son, our beloved Lord and Savior, 
Yahawa, Bahasham, Yahawa Shai, Bahasham, Harachak Wadash. Double honors as always to our apostles and our elders of Great Millstone who rule well, who teach well, who we learn the truth from daily, whether you're here for bear. And a sincere salutations as always to the rest of the hopeful elected of the nation of Israel, which consists of our sincere elders and Akim of Great Millstone and the Akim on down that teach the likewise doctrine. The speckled bird Hebrew is like foreigners scattered among the heathen that look like the heathen. The sincere Akim of the nation of Israel that rehearse the righteous acts of the Heavenly Father, Yahweh Shah, that are believers in his word. And the sincere Akwathim of the nation of Israel, which is to say the sincere sisters of the nation of Israel, listen in silence and meekness as the scriptures command to do so. Kwam Yasharala and Ababa Ball. We almost out of here. Adawan Ratiza, and we got next. Adawan Ratiza. Shema Yasha Allah, Yahawa, Allah Hainawa, Yahawa, Achad. Wa Yahawa, Bahasham, Yahweh Shai, Baba Kusha, Baba Kusha, Baba Kusha. Shalach Rayam, Wa Ainashim, Wa Haragim, Wa Ashim, Wa Abadim, Wa Mashapatim, all call Adawamim, Wa Gawayim, Wa Ayabim Nawa, Wa Babal, Wa Babal, Wa Babal, Wa Babal. I thought, I thought, I thought, I thought, the water, the Tawab, Aman. Shabbat Shalom.